Holy Spirit, come, please help me. You are the helper, the guide, the comforter, the counselor. I thank you that you live in us and all around us. And if we, through our will, our desire, surrender and submit to you, you can move freely. So in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, I fully surrender to you. I ask you to take full control of my mind, my heart, my body, my soul. May I just be your servant. May you speak through me exactly what you want to speak today. Not too much, not too little. Help me to also discipline this body to speak it in the way you want to speak it. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts for your word. May your word transform us. May it glorify Jesus and Christ in us and Christ coming. Purify your bride, Lord. Glorify us so that we may glorify you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In glorifying the Lord, the Lord has put two verses on my heart to make sure to establish for myself and for us as a church. The church is reforming, the church at large. I'm talking about the big C church. We're just one part of this, of the greater church. And that's what all the letters in the New Covenant is about. you got the Ephesians, which is to Ephesus, Philippians to the people of Philippi, Colossians to the people of Colossus, Corinthians to the people of Corinth, is the church, the wheat and the tares got infused. And it was from the conception, um, as Jesus is teaching, you have the Gentile philosophers along with their pagan worship and religion, along with Judaism and the Old Covenant legalism. All these religions and all these philosophies were getting merged and taught. And so Jesus is speaking through Paul and others to try to purify the church back to his teachings. And that's what the book of Ephesians is doing to the people of Ephesus. This book is very, very powerful, and I believe it has practical application to us today um, and I'm going to begin to impart to that. But to get to the truth, we have to understand the truth as a person, first and foremost. It's Jesus Christ. There is absolute truth, and it's Jesus Christ, and it's what he taught. For us, and we sang this song, for those that are listening online, welcome. But prior to this, we sang a song that says, Shake up all my traditions. And it says, Because we know your way is better, and we surrender and we submit to you. That's a great song to sing, but do you truly believe that? And are you willing to let the Holy Spirit do that? A tradition is something that you believed was good, and that's why you held on to it. But the Word of God also says the tradition of men make the Word of God a none effect. So we can be believing things that we thought were good, but it's actually constraining the fullness of the Holy Spirit and holding Him back and or, most importantly, the life of Christ, because that's what the Holy Spirit's role is, is to glorify Jesus Christ both in us and Christ coming. And so the book of Ephesians and the books of Acts really challenge traditions. I personally believe the purest form of teaching is through Christ. My goal is to simply try to highlight the word of God written and also Jesus in his teaching so you can see it. And my hope and prayer for us as a church and everybody listening online, that every discussion you have, whether it's in the men's Bible studies on Tuesdays, the women's Bible studies on Mondays, all the offshoot gatherings you're meeting at, as you're talking about the Word of God, bringing it back to this, 1 John 2, 6, whoever claims to be live in him. So if you claim to be Christian, you're a little Christ-like one. So whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Immaturity does not want to accept that. Immaturity wants individuality, which is separation from him. Maturity is about conformity. We're all predestined, predetermined to be conformed back into the image of Christ. You'll see that later on in Ephesians. But true maturity is when you surrender and submit to become like Christ because you believe he's the good one. There's only one good one, and that is God himself. And out of respect for him and his ways, you believe that you can live this way, this life the best by just being like him, and we can all do that. 
But to get back to that, the reason why we live separate from him, it could be our own beliefs. But oftentimes what we're doing is we're putting some other person's belief or philosophy or faith. Faith and philosophy are the same thing. Philosophy is just you're acting on what you believe, and that's the same thing faith is. So we're putting some other person's tradition before what Jesus taught, therefore we're not living like him. And so it's getting back, and so as we talk, and I encourage you, I'm not going to be able to unpack all the teachings I get to in Acts today. We're going to start with Acts to set the foundation for Ephesians. Because Acts talks a lot, it gives us a cultural perspective of what's happening in Ephesus. So the book of Acts is a, an additional writing to the epistles. So as there, as you got Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, you can look at the book of Acts, and it also records the Acts of the Apostles as they're living it out. And so you're going to see what it was like, what was happening in Ephesus as Paul's going there and speaking to the Ephesians. So it helps you to understand the backdrop of the meaning of what he's teaching. That's then, but to bring it into practical application today, history repeats itself and we're seeing a growth of, ex of a lot of ways what happened in Ephesus. And so it can prepare us for what we're beginning to face, but even more and more will face to come. So first and foremost, let's get back to, okay, did Jesus say this? Did Jesus do that? How did Jesus present whatever's being taught? But then also because he is, he is the I am, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we have to get back to him to find truth. That's the only way to absolute truth. You can get deceived trusting any other person, including me. That's why all I'm trying to be is a witness to Jesus through the scriptures so you can see it for yourself, so you can get right back to it. But if you listen to other people's teachings that aren't highlighting Jesus, even if they're quoting scripture, you can get lost. That's what the devil does. The devil quotes scripture all throughout it. He did it in the garden. He quoted God, but he brought a half-truth and he taught it and people got deceived. So the only way out of deception is getting back to everything that Jesus said and did but then the pierced form, I believe, of the church, the gathering of the church, is the book of Acts. Before it got super tainted, you can see how they're walking it out because they're the first generation expression of it. So now, going into Ephesians. So first I want to make a note of Ephesus. When you think of Ephesus, and you're going to see this through the, through the Acts coming up here shortly, there's two images that most people would connotate with Ephesus or the people of Ephesians. And it would be the shrine of Artemis, which that was her temple. So Artemis was a great goddess. She was the goddess of the Ephesians. So the, the place of Ephesus is in Asia, which is now Turkey. So it was the hub of economy, philosophy, all kinds of I believe it's Turkey. It's in Asia. Is that right, Andrew? Historical fact. Yeah, Asia Minor. So it's, it was a hub of all kinds of culture and economics, but also religious beliefs. And the great religious belief, along with the great economic driver, was Artemis. Artemis was the goddess of nature, childbirth, wildlife. That's why you see the picture image of this. Healing. She claimed to know how to heal people, the hunt, sudden death, animals, virginity, young women, and archery. And so she, and you're going to see through Acts, would influence all these different philosophers and pitical, um, pivotal people, pinnacle people in the Greco-Roman culture, and they would begin to teach a certain way based on her. And so she was the most emphasized person in this culture along with her temple. And so that is the context. Her name in the Greek is Artemis. Her Roman name is Diana. And one thing to note about that is the little G gods, as Colossian called them, the fallen angels, um, they basically just would take on different names based on different regions and cultures. Today, I believe we still have worship of some of the same gods that were back in the Greco-Roman culture. It's just the language has changed, so they got a new name. Because when you look at the principles of the way they worship these gods of the past, you look at the principles of the way people are worshiping the modern gods, it's the same principles, just a different name. 
And so, but it's not uncommon that they'd have multiple names depending on their geographical location. And so now let's begin to look at the, the church of Ephesus in accordance to Acts. So this is found in Acts 19. You can follow along. I highlighted specific areas so that we can begin to unpack it. In Acts 19, 1 through 41, if you're following along, I'm speaking from the NIV translation. And it says this, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at where? Ephesus. So he arrives at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. In the modern church, when we, most people think of disciple, they think of a disciple is uh, someone who's learned from Jesus, about Jesus, someone who wants to follow Jesus. That's a disciple. So he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What, Paul? Why would you ask disciples if they received the Holy Spirit when you believed? Hmm, interesting question. Let's go on. They answered, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So do you see how these disciples, they were Christian, they're following Jesus. They were being, they learned about the Christian way, but they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And that is not uncommon in the modern era today. I have lots of people that came to, come to me often weekly and say, I grew up in the church. I heard of the Holy Spirit. I knew as part of the Trinity, but I really don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And so if you're there, that's fine. There's now no condemnation, but you got to be honest and say, okay, that's an area where you can grow in faith, and I and others would love to help you. You see that there is a growth process. There's an order of growth here that you can be following Jesus but not being led by the Holy Spirit because you don't even know. You can be initially saved. So what is, let's breaking this down, you see they said we received John's baptism. And then it goes on to say, then they were baptized as he laid on. So there's two baptisms. But Andy, that's confusing, which I can't get to it today, because in Ephesians later on, it says there's one baptism. Well, you just need to understand how the scripture works. Everything has an order. Just like there's one God, three persons. There's one baptism, but there's three parts to that baptism, which we're going to begin to I'll show you through scripture today. There's John's baptism, there's baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then there's baptism by fire. Let me just show you that in Scripture. So this is found in Luke 3, 16. This may shake somebody's tradition. I grew up around traditional denominations that did not teach this um, when I was a younger. And I was like, whoa, can I believe this? So you've got to say, well, what are you going to accept as your belief? What someone's teaching you or what the Word of God says? So Luke 3, 15 says this. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. So this is John the Baptist. They're saying, is this prophet, is he the Messiah? John answered them, all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, whose straps and whose sandals I'm not, I'm, I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So you see, John says, I baptize you with water, and he, Jesus, baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. So you see there's three parts to this. And he goes on to say, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John's baptism, starting there, is a baptism of repentance. It's repenting just means you change your thinking and you change your heart to change your ways. 
for we all are coming out of the wrong way, which is any way other than God's way, Jesus. So we're all coming from either legalism under the Jewish Old Covenant law or Gentile philosophy or wrong religion through Gentiles. We all started there, and we're coming out of that. If we choose, you can remain in it as your tradition, but repentance is just saying, I believe there's a better way, and his name is Jesus, and I'm going to decide to change my mind and my heart and begin to follow his way, Jesus, versus that way of the other ways, any other way. And so baptism of repentance is where you're baptized with water saying, I no longer want to follow this old covenant legalistic sacrificial system of the Judaism, or I no longer want to follow any other pagan religion, or I don't want to just follow some philosopher from the Greco-Roman culture or modern philosophy. I believe Jesus has the best way of everything. So you repent from thinking that way that you were doing and living that way one way, and then you turn to Jesus, and the water is supposed to symbolize that two things. When you go down, you're dying to the old way. You're putting it to death. And it's death to sin. Sin means separation from God's way. So you're saying, I no longer want to sin anymore. I don't want to go my own way. I want to go Jesus' way. So I'm going to destroy sin and that my heart's desire to do that because now I want to go the right way. And so when you come up, you're washed away from all sin. It's destroyed in your life. You're purified, made whole and righteous. And now you want to do good more than you want to do bad and pursue Jesus' way. That's John's baptism. The Holy Spirit then dwells through Scripture in you, but it's very clear through the life of Jesus. He is the perfect example. He got baptized by John, and then when he came up, what happened to him? The dove descended on him as representative of the Holy Spirit, and he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's you, why you see Jesus was fully human. You didn't see any of the gifts of the Spirit operating in his life for the first 30 years until he went John's baptism and then the secondary experience of the empowerment in the Holy Spirit. Now he began to operate in the supernatural. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The best practical way I can explain the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a modern way is think of like a car. You have a battery. In that battery, it has power already in it. But if you leave the lights on, you lose the power. So do you go and open up the hood and then break open the battery to try to fix the power in the battery? Or do you simply just open up the hood, put jumper cables on it, and it activates what's in it? It activates what's already in it. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is just activating what's already been in you. It's giving you that jump start of power. Does that make sense? And if you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, please come up after this. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, I and others can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. That is the doctrine of laying on a hands. Hebrews 6. When someone who has it is just like jumper cables, by faith, I obey what Jesus said. I lay my hand on you, and we pray for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and it will activate Christ in you. But you can't receive that Holy Spirit until you first receive Christ. Because he's the way, the truth, and life. So it's through that forgiveness. Now your spirit is made clean, righteous, and now you can operate in the fullness. So that's the secondary experience is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that's not the full maturity. The full maturity takes you on to harvest. It's the baptism by fire. That is what, there's a threefold salvation. Baptism by water is the salvation of the spirit. You're going from a broken spirit that wants to do bad to a whole spirit that wants to do good, salvation by water and spirit. The second baptism is really about salvation of your soul, your mental emotional state. It's where you submit and surrender to what's already in you. It's written on your heart so that you can release it out. That act of faith of surrendering and coming in a posture of humility allows for that to flow out. So there's the salvation of the soul, the empowerment and release of that what's in you. And the third and final salvation is of our physical body and the earth. That is what we're waiting for as well. But it's very important to operate 
through salvation one and two, which helps you overcome this present evil age. Without it, you'll be working in your own works and can get deeply deceived. And so salvation three is where that's by fire. That is where God is going to come. He is going to judge again. There is a judgment day set and he is going to burn up the whole earth and it will be just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Those who are saved spiritually will be saved out of that. But it is my job to prepare you because we could be here on the earth on this day or to prepare the future generation church is it will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Believers will be on the earth and seeing the trumpets being released, which are the fire judgments. But you have to have the faith knowing that those comets or whatever they are, fireballs from heaven that are falling are not aimed at us. They're aimed at evil coming after us that we don't need to fear, but God is going to save us out of that wrath. But there will be a generation on the earth that, during that time. And so you have to prepare your heart and your mind in the fullness of truth prior to that. And to know the truth about God's judgment day as it goes on, Mark 9 says, And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and become thrown into hell. Hell is different than Hades. This is a reference to hell, which is a geographical location just south of Jerusalem. Hell is an actual physical location called the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna. It is just south of Israel. It's a physical place, and that's where the lake of fire will be. Hades is the abode of the dead that's below the earth where temporary spiritual beings are held until the judgment day. It is not the final judgment, though. Hades gets opened up. This is Revelation chapter 20. Hades gets opened up prior to the final judgment. This is a reference to will be thrown into that lake of fire. Now watch what it says about it. Where the worms, everybody say worms, that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. So you see the fire is not quenched and who do not die? Worms. There's some wrong teaching in the church and I'll let you discuss that after this. But the worms do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with what? Fire. So there is a future context where God is going to burn the back 40 because it got too many weeds and start it all over with the perfect seed, which is those who are saved, redeemed, who want to do more good than bad, want to follow Jesus and live in love and community, inheriting the earth together forever. That's why it goes and says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be what? At peace with each other. So getting to know the judgment day will help produce peace in you when you understand God's heart and his order. Because you have to know God is not going to allow evil to win. Love wins in the end. But he has a sovereign plan which he's working it out to perfection. He is in control of the heavens and the earth. But part of that is he's letting the earth get out of control because he turned it over to us to our own desire. And that is where we have to choose to repent and come back into his will to release the greatest amount of victory. But you need to know in regards to the final judgment so you don't live with the wrong type of fear. Matthew 25 says, Then he will say to those on his left, which he is Jesus, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for whom? the devil and his angels. The world will never be perfected until the devil and his angels are destroyed. God knows that. He's waiting for us to wake up and understand that, to call him back, to judge the devil and his angels and destroy them so Eden can be restored on the earth. But we have to loose this. It's our job. We have been given the ability to co-labor with him to do this. But you need to know it's God's desire is not for us. He knows in Hebrews 6 that the devil and his angels went rogue and they're not coming back. Their hearts are hardened. They're only out to try to steal, kill, and destroy you. And therefore, our God is a good father and he's not going to let his kids be destroyed forever. And he's a just judge. And what he's waiting for is this. Psalm 51.4 says this, that you, this is you, that God may be found just when he speaks 
and blameless when he judges. We've got to mature to the point of, is it okay for God to kill some of his creation? Is it okay for God to judge some of his creation? Is it right for God to judge and condemn and destroy some of his creation? Because the ultimate question is, who really is his creation? We get to choose whether we want to be the sons of God or remain the sons of the devil. The repentance is coming back to the sons of God. But I'm going to bring it to you as a parent. If you had two kids and one kid got into addiction, got out of their right mind, and was out to destroy your other kid, how long would you let it happen? We forget he's a loving father, but he's also a just judge. And we got to get to this maturity of understanding that God knows every person's heart and spirit and where they're at and who will repent and who won't, and we trust him to be the judge. He is the only one judge. But there is a judgment day coming, and he's not going to allow evil to remain forever. And you can find peace in knowing that because the darkness and evil will continue to grow until the very last day. But God's heart ultimately is this, 1 Timothy 2. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants how many people? All people to be saved. There's wrong denominational teaching saying that God has predestined only certain human beings to be saved. That's not true. God's predestined all people. He wants all people to be saved. It's all there, the possibility for them to be saved, but unfortunately he knows not everybody's going to choose him. He's chosen everyone, but not everybody chooses him. That's the difference. It's not where he just chose a few human beings. He wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of what? Truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. So we're to mature into the truth, into Christ. For there is one God and one meteor between God and mankind, mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. He paid the sin debt. He forgave the entire world. The grace is he saved us all from being broken, messed up, deceived, dark, under the control of the devil, and we can be freed, and it's for all mankind. That's the grace. But the faith is, are you going to apply that salvation to your life and begin to walk like Jesus? Because you can choose not to. That is the choice, and that's what we're seeing partake in the book of Acts that starts to get need to get corrected. <clears throat> going so back into this, verse 6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Acts 2 says, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're enabled. Everybody say enabled. Amen. So does that mean you'll automatically pray in tongues? No, it means you can if you want to. I would strongly encourage you, if you don't, to reach out to somebody who does because it's a very powerful gift. Here's what it does for you. Jude says, when you pray in the Spirit, it builds up your most holy faith. So faith is the opposite of fear. So when you're struggling in life with fear, if you pray in tongues, it will switch you over to faith and it will bring mental clarity to you. You won't know exactly in your mind how it works, so that's what 1 Corinthians 12-14 through 14 says. You begin to pray in tongues. It's your direct relationship to God, a specific language between you and God. You're speaking to Him. He speaks back to you. And then you ask and say, God, now speak to my mind and clarify it. And you'll begin to get clarity to help you overcome this present age. It's a very powerful gift along with prophecy. Prophecy is the ability to see ahead of times. But I'm going to shake some traditions, and I know I'm going to get persecuted from this. But I'm going to do it anyways, because I love Jesus. Today's modern prophecy in the modern church, we got to get back to Jesus. Did Jesus prophesy like that? Did Jesus say those things? And did the apostles prophesy like that? And did the apostles say these things? Because I'm going to challenge us to get into conversation and bring it back to Jesus and the prophets. Because what I see happening a lot in the church, and there's deception, modern quote-unquote prophets, self-proclaimed prophets, they may be Christian, 
but I believe a lot of them are deceived because they're more focused on what's called Gnosticism than Christ. When you study what they're saying, it's what the Bible actually calls more as fortune telling or soothsaying due to divination. And they countered that. That was called false prophecy. False prophecy was fortune telling, soothsaying, and divination. And a lot of what's in the Christian church as being called prophecy in the modern era under this new covenant is not what the new covenant defines as prophecy. I'm going to give you the scripture verse. You can choose whether you want to stand on it or not. In the new covenant, we have a definition for prophecy. It's found in Revelation 19. It says this, Revelation 19.10, At this I fell at his feet to worship him, that him is an angel. So this is John, and he sees an angel, and he falls at his feet. And then, but he, the angel said to me, don't do that. There are many people saying they're hearing from an angel, or an angel saw them. That should put a yellow flag in front of you. Angels can be fallen angels too. It doesn't mean it's right. There's many people that say in prayer, I got a word or a feeling or expression, but you got to test that, the scripture says, and you bring it back to Christ. If you don't test it and bring it back to Christ, and you don't bring it back to the written scriptures, you could get deceived. But he said to them, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with whom? You. So this angel says, I'm a fellow servant with you. Do you see the humility from heaven? Angels are like, don't glorify me. I'm just a servant. Right now in the modern era, there are so many false gospels, false teachings, false prophets who are trying to glorify themselves through what they say and what they do, and they're trying to make money from it too, which I didn't see in Jesus' day. I didn't see Jesus market himself. I didn't see him hang up flyers. I didn't see the apostles do the same thing. I didn't see the, them selling merchandise based on what they said and did. But it goes on to say... All right, the Holy Spirit's saying I need to unpack that or I'll be severely flogged. <laughs> Why do we believe we have to go beyond Jesus' way? People say to me, Andy, you box up the Holy Spirit. I get this often. Because couldn't the Holy Spirit do more now in this age than then? What if it's the opposite? What if we're supposed to box ourselves up so we can keep the gospel, the gospel, and Jesus, Jesus, and the power, the power? Why do we need to add more to the gospel? Isn't it powerful enough? See, I believe it's the opposite. It's self-control. That's boxing. We need to box ourselves up so that the power of the gospel can be made glorified. Does that make sense? I'm not limiting the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to release it because then the word of God becomes the word of God. The minute you start to market it, you're, you're diluting the gospel. It seems superficial. And that's why people question it. The early church never did that. But what we've done is we've gotten into all these teachings to combine, hey, say this, pronounce that, make some money, get rich. I don't see that in Jesus in the early church. I just don't. And every time I attempt to do that, I get a conviction in my heart and I have to stop. Because I just don't see that in Jesus. It goes on to say, and with your brothers and sisters. So that's all you, right? So we're just supposed to see ourselves as servants. Today, people are seeing themselves, I'm a prophet, I'm an apostle, I'm a... How about you let him be the I am, and we just be servants? How about we're all conformed to be Jesus, and some may function by being a, giving prophecy, some may function as being a servant, but that's not our identity. The minute we start to make our gifts our identity, I think we're starting to get lost. Because we're conformed into the identity of Christ. We all are. Not into the gifts. Into the giver because we have all the gifts. Does that make sense? And with prophecy, it goes on to say, and with the brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of whom? Jesus worship God for it is the, please read this last sentence with me, if you can. For it is the spirit of what? Spirit of who what? There's testimony to Jesus. I hear so many prophets and prophecies, and I, I don't even hear anything about Jesus and who Jesus is and what he did. 
If it's a true biblical prophecy, it should be edifying and bearing witness to Jesus. If it's a prophecy that's telling you how rich you're going to be next month, that's called in the Bible soothsaying or fortune telling. There's no difference between a modern fortune teller and that. We've twisted this thing through Gentile pagan beliefs, and that came on when Rome took on the church right at the end of the first millennia. Gnosticism entered in and infused all these wrong philosophies and teachings, and we've got to get back to the purest form of Jesus and the first church if we truly want to grow and mature with this. Do I have any amens with that? Amen. Okay. Because I just believe Jesus is enough. I believe the cross is enough. I believe the resurrection is enough. And I don't think we need to commercialize it. It's a powerful salvation message, and we should not be ashamed to share this salvation message with everybody. Going on now from here. How am I doing on time? All right. So verse 7 says, There are about 12 men in all. Verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue. So a synagogue is a Jewish church building. So Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. So he's speaking in a Jewish church. So I want you, those, we can learn from everything. Do you see how evangelism was? They went into churches that are veiled legally, and what did they start doing? Speaking to them. So maybe should we go into some veiled churches and try to start teaching people, speaking to people? That can be a form of evangelism. Instead of waiting for people to come to us, we can go to them. One example that we can arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. So trying to persuade people back to the true pure kingdom of God, the teachings of Jesus. Verse 9, but some of them became obstinate. Obstinate means hard-hearted or stubborn. There's a lot of obstinate, hard-hearted, stubborn people today. Can I get an amen? amen. Would you agree even in the church? People often come to me and with problems, but they're unwilling to change. Well, your problem is caused by something you're believing wrong. That's how it works. And if you're not willing to change your believing, then you're, you're stubborn and you're never going to change. You're hard-hearted. You're obstinate. What it really is is you're proud. You're believing that your way is right, and so your problem's never going to change. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to be condemning. I'm just trying to be honest to try to help free everyone. It goes on, and, and that's where, it, verse 9, some of them were obstinate and refused to believe and publicly malaligned what? The way. Who's the way? Who's the way? Who's the way? Do you believe that? I mean, it's cute to say it as a church, but do you truly believe it? That he is the way, the truth, and life. And do you see how we're starting right here with the Jewish faith publicly is malaligning it because they're stubborn and hard-hearted under legalism and their traditions. But this is sandwiched. We're going to go to the Gentile beliefs right after this. There's a lot of public malaligning the true way from both the Jew and the Gentile. And that's what he's trying to get clarity out of the F Ephesus about. Because they refuse to believe Jesus, the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily. So he leaves the Jews. You'll see they generally start with his own. That's what I encourage in evangelism. Start with your own. Start with those who are legalists, who are still veiled. If you're Christian, they can be veiled under the Old Covenant Testament law, still doing things the way under the Old Covenant without operating in the New Covenant. As, everybody say, as seen through Jesus. Because there's a lot of wrong teaching about New Covenant that's not through Jesus too right now. So I'm going to say New Covenant as seen through Jesus. Because he's the way. But then he says, okay, you're stubborn, you're obstinate. Do you see how you can be free to move on? So if, you're, if someone is not willing to change and they're just being stubborn, it's okay to move on and go find some others. Jesus said that often. Because you're only going to learn... If you want to, that's humility. You've got to drop your pride to l learn the way of Jesus. But if you're so stuck in your way, you're not willing to, so there's only other one option to change your heart. You have to go through your own way. 
and you'll go through your own tribulation, you won't get your own results, and then hopefully you'll repent. God doesn't, that's not God's preferred way, but that's the only way you can parent. If your children don't listen to you, then you've got to turn them over to their own ways and watch them suffer until they finally get to the end of themselves and come back to the right way and willing to listen to you because they respect you. What's lacking in the church, the fear of the Lord today is people don't respect Jesus because he is graceful and merciful. So we just abuse his grace and mercy and want to just keep doing it our own way. We've got to get back to just truly respecting God. Do you love him, but do you also respect him? Do you want to go his way? He goes on to say, so he's now in discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrant. We can learn something about evangelism here too. You see how he went to the lecture hall? You go to a place where a lot of people are publicly discussing things. And this is the Gentile way. People who just want to talk about this world and philosophy, go to them and just teach them how their philosophy won't work. Try to discuss with them daily. Bring them back to the philosophy of Christ. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. So Paul committed two years daily trying to help get people back to the way of Jesus. And do you see how they got malaligned the word both because of the Jewish traditions but also the Gentile philosophical and their religious traditions. And he's trying to get it back to the purest form. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Notice how illness and evil are connected hand in hand. God did not put sickness on you. Evil did. Sin entered which brought sickness. Sin brought sickness and death. It's evil and God wants you out of it. But you got to learn how to work together with the way, Jesus' way, to get out of it. One thing, I, in my humble honesty, whenever I get sick, I say to myself, I got off the wrong, right way. My, the fear of the Lord in me now is I just don't want to do it my own way. I suffered enough through my own self-induced tribulation. I believe Jesus' way is the best. And so when I start to get sick, all, I'm, all I know is my spirit's always perfect. That didn't get off. So then my, my soul realm got off, or I started physically doing something I shouldn't have, and that's why I'm sick. Because my spirit doesn't change. And so I'm out of the way, which is perfect, so that produced the illness. So then I check myself in the soul realm, mental, emotional, and conscience. And, if, and then I ask others, because sometimes you can be veiled by your own pride. So I'll ask my wife or some close friends, say, hey, do you see anything in me? Where, because I'm stuck, and usually my wife's like, yeah, you jerk. <laughs> right? Because you, you're so obstinate, you think you're doing it right, right? Because when you're, when you're proud and you're selfish, you don't see. Because you're thinking you're doing it right. And you don't even see what's coming across. So that's what the church is supposed to gently self-correct each other. You should have people in your life, when you're not... When you're not getting the results you want, you can go to them and trust they love you and will speak truth to you gracefully and tell you if you've gotten off the way from Christ. But then will you humbly receive it and repent? That's the other part of it. And so evil, so sickness, illness, and they were cured. And we're going to take communion in a second. It says if you take communion properly, you can be cured cured of your diseases. In fact, it says a lot of people were sick because they didn't take communion properly. Because to come to communion, if you take it properly, it's very powerful. I, I could teach the whole message just on that. But to begin it, it starts with getting your, your spirit. If it's not made right, if you're not a believer today, you can become a believer. It's just understanding that God died for all sins, past, present, and future. And if you made one mistake, you're not perfect. So the only way into perfection is through forgiveness so that you can be healed spiritually by receiving forgiveness, coming into relationship with Jesus. You just say, thank you for forgiveness. I want to be healed spiritually. And then you receive it. The blood represents the forgiveness of sins because Jesus paid for the sin of the world. He shed his blood and purifies us spiritually. But then the body, his physical body got broken to teach us how to become strong in love. 
And so as you meditate on him, you then meditate on the life of Christ and you examine and you say, okay, is there anything that I need to confess to somebody else or get right with my soul? Is my soul off? You don't stay in condemnation, you get out of it. The point of communion is get out of all condemnation. But it's to get honest and get set free and get healed. But then you can even begin to see the elements in a very powerful way, like the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that I, you can even look at it as like medicine coming in. And if you receive the power of that, that has the power uh, to activate everything in you to heal instantaneously. But that's spiritual. It's taking something that's natural to bring it to an absolute spiritual truth, John 6. But it's, it's hard for people in the West to think spiritually because we often think carnally, but to take something to heart in a very powerful spiritual way and one can. So in that, but you see how there's a deep relationship to get to this and it is spiritual. As I begin to wrap up here in 13, as I get closer to this, 13 says, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who are <laughs> demon possessed. The name of Jesus has power because it means salvation. Salvation is the most powerful word in the world because you're going from something that's broken or weak to something that's made whole. That's power. That's wholeness. So that's why the name Jesus has so much power. And these people... They were just using, they were seeing how the disciples were saying the name of Jesus and demons were being cast out. So they started to do the same. And they would, and then it goes on, they would, um, they would say, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Verse 14, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them. So can evil spirits talk? Can you hear evil spirits? You get your soul in the wrong place and you can hear that stuff. You keep your soul in the right place, you learn to only hear the voice of God. But they heard this, and it says, Jesus, I'm, so this evil spirit says, Jesus, I what? So do the evil spirits know of who the almighty way is? Sure do. And Paul, I know. So they even knew Paul. But who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. What can we learn about this? Authority is in Christ. That's why it's time to grow up and mature. You can have an ascent of who Jesus is, but that does not give you power over the, over the demonic realm. And the days are going to get more evil, and you're going to start to see more spiritual things, demonically obsessed and possessed. And you've got to have such a relationship with Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that you know how to operate by faith and not by fear so that when you counter something spiritual, that demon will shudder and flee from you versus mock you and say, who are you? Because we know you're weak because you don't even really know who you are. It's becoming secure of who you are in Christ. It's not you doing the works. It's Christ in you. And because Christ is in you, every knee shall bow that's before you. It's separating yourself to becoming, as Paul said, it's, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And yes, beloved, we need to get more and more to this. Let me just pray a sec. Timing here. Let me just modernize it a brief moment for the Christian church, and then we'll come and finish, go to next week, 17 on. So most people think, I know the average Christian, I used to think this way, and I talked to a lot of people as, well, this was all back then. Beloved, this is still today. If you get outside of the United States, there is still a lot of worshiping other gods. Think of India. India, they worship all kinds of gods, Hinduism, polytheism, but what's becoming more prevalent that the church needs to get prepared for is you're going to see in Acts, it's very similar, and in, in Ephesus, it's very similar to what we're experiencing in the Muslim world. Rioting. Demanding worship of this God. Or will destroy you. 
And we need to begin to prepare ourselves like the book of Acts, as we're going to go to part B of this next week, so we can see what they started to do, because Allah and Jesus Christ are not the same God. Muhammad is not John the Baptist. Christians are also believing a lie that Jesus and Allah are a way to the Father. No, they're not. A Muslim does not see that, nor should we as Christians see that. They are two separate deities. And there is going to be an increase of persecution simply because there is an increase of numbers of believers to Allah. And we're going to talk more about that in the coming. And I want to say this with love because you see a part of it in Acts. Is our battle against people? No, it's against spiritual entities, Ephesians 6. The average Muslim is like the average Christian that doesn't read their book. They're just going off of five principles. Here are their five principles. For them to get into eternal life, they have profession of faith to Allah and his messenger Muhammad. First principle. Second is ritual prayer, prayer five times a day. The third is give a portion of one's wealth to the poor. The fourth is fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. The fifth is pilgrimage once in a lifetime to Mecca. So those are the five pillars that they're, they don't really read the Quran. They don't really read a lot of them, the majority of them. They're just good-natured, peace-loving. They want to find peace people. That's why we should learn from Acts and be able to minister to people to help them to find the fullness of love, grace, and truth. But there are some real evil people within Christianity and real evil people in other religions, in Islam, that are using... Um, they're false prophets, false teachers, false believers in every religion, which is going to come to a head. And we just need to be prepared for that in the future. And even part of you need to understand the reality with the Muslim faith is if one person, they see the scale, and Allah, his judgment day is, did you do enough of these five verses, your bad works, and maybe you'll get in. But what most people don't know, what Muhammad said is, what will help slant the scales for you before the day of judgment is if you enter into jihad, which is a holy war against Jews and Christians, the scale gets tipped in your favor, but then it really gets tipped in your favor for eternal life is if you kill a Jew or Christian or you kill yourself. That was in the latter parts of Muhammad, and that's why these, this is happening in today's era. And you're going to see, are we starting to see more riots throughout the world? And I want to to begin to end with this, because that's what you're going to see in the next book of Acts, is they're rioting for Artemis. And they wanted to destroy Paul because of his beliefs to the way. And so we can learn from Acts, we can learn from the Ephesians about what they did to stay safe, to walk in power and authority, even in the midst the philosophies and the religions outside of the way. Can you please come on up? And so there is a very practical application, which we're going to talk more and more next week. But I want to take us into communion in this. And for those listening online, we're going to enter into communion. That will end this video. Where are you at in your relationship with Jesus Christ today? Are you spiritually good? Have you asked for forgiveness of all your sins? If you are, then you're perfect and righteous. If you haven't yet, all it takes is humility to ask that. Because he loves you and he wants all to be saved and none to perish in the entire world. So if you're spiritually good, then ask yourself, where am I at in my soul? Mental, emotional, and conscience state. But get really, really honest with yourself. Now is the time to get honest. Not to live in condemnation, but to get out of it through communion. Here's how I'm going to help you get out of it. You've got to go to the third fold salvation. Most people don't think that far in advance. Matthew 12, 36 or 37 says this, But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. I want you to see how the final judgment works. I'm going to say that again. But I tell you, everyone will be, have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken. So you're going to stand before Almighty God, and you're going to have to give an account for your life. What are you going to say? I meditate on that daily. 
The way I see it, you can accept it for your own, but I'm going to say to Jesus, thank you, Jesus, that the only reason I deserve eternity is not because of anything I did. It's because you forgave me for all my sins and you brought actual opportunity through your grace, your mercy, your sacrifice. The only way into heaven is through you. Thank you, Jesus. But then I also envision saying, okay, you're in. But I got a question for Andy. Did you live like my son Jesus did? And I'll have to give an account on that day. Did I live like you, Jesus? That's where I get really honest with myself. What am I going to say on that day and account for my life? Ask yourself as you're taking communion, am I living like Jesus did? And if you're not, that's where just the beauty is repent back, get right, receive mercy. Thank you, God, you've forgiven me for everything. But I want to get my conscience in a good, clear state and just make a declaration. I want to start living like you. And to do that, God, I receive your mercy and your gifts and your power so you can heal me so I can be restored back to the fullness that you want me to walk in. Don't live in condemnation. Come out of it through the freeing grace of the cross. Be healed, be restored, receive the fullness of his love, but then to begin to walk like Jesus in goodness every day in power and purpose because you can. Can I just get a few people to come on up and grab the elements? Anybody? Thanks, Jamie. Two more. Thanks, Troy. One more. So, beloved, as we begin to worship, you can take communion, and if you're watching online, you can hear me. I encourage you, pause, take a moment. Listen to some music. Reflect on Jesus. The proper way to take communion is to reflect on Jesus. His grace is good enough. His forgiveness is powerful. His love is always. Take this time to just get right with him. Get your heart right. Get your mind right. And get your body right. Receive. His body was broken for you so your body can even be made whole so that you can walk in holiness and power and purpose every day. He loves you and he gives you this time to build, strengthen, and encourage you from this broken world. There is now no shame or condemnation but restoration because we're coming out of darkness into light and he doesn't want you to live in darkness. He doesn't want you to live under shame and guilt. He doesn't want you to live in any of that. He wants you to be set free. So as we enter into worship, be set free through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to hear this. Partly I was bound by time and I went part B, so I know where I'm going next week, but somebody needs to hear it now so they don't get into condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus was full of grace and truth. One day we'll stand before the fullness of grace and truth. The grace is the forgiveness piece. The grace is the mercy where he still blesses us even in the midst of our mess. And he is gracious and merciful, but he's also truth. He's light. He's, he's the truth. And on that day, it says perfect love dries out fear because fear has to do with punishment. God is not going to punish us if we're saved in him, if we receive the forgiveness of God. But it doesn't say we won't punish ourselves. The soul realm, when you're not living in truth, when you're exposed to truth, it's very difficult then you can enter into when you know you're doing what you shouldn't do, and you're caught in that to get under condemnation. And when you look at scriptures, and we'll talk more about that because that's what Ephesians is talking, we'll be getting into is when you stand before a righteous God, every motive will get exposed. He's not going to judge or condemn you, but who may judge or condemn you? Yourself. Hebrews says the law is written on our heart. Moral truth is in us. It's whether we're obeying it or rejecting it. And so we, when we stand before the holy moral one, that light will expose all darkness motives in our heart. And we're going to have to encounter the truth within ourselves. God doesn't condemn us, nor does he punish us. But his grace and his mercy will continually help to help restore us. Does that make sense? Because we still are a soul being along with the spiritual aspect of it. So... That is why my encouragement to you is just get really honest with yourself today. Are you living in truth? Be truthful with yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Compare yourself to Christ. The good news is if you're not living like him, 
just all God is looking for as a good father is a pure motive. Parents, aren't you just looking for that in your kid? Like I just, you're waiting for your kid just to want to do the right thing out of respect for you. You don't really care if they do it perfectly every time, do you? You just want to know their desire isn't going in the right direction. That's the same way the father is. Is he wants us to have a pure desire and pure motive to want to do right more and more than want to do wrong. And so just get your heart into the right place. Don't live in condemnation. Don't, and even get out of condemning yourself through God's grace. But you have to accept truth to truly get out of it. The last, other last encouragement I felt like the Lord, I, I've taught on this a lot in the past, but in case someone hasn't heard it, because I alluded to some sickness can be a direct effect due to our own soul issues or our own physical life. You can reap what you sow. If I choose to hit myself with a hammer, am I going to hurt myself? Yes, that's not God's will. He'd be saying as a father, don't be stupid, stop hitting your hand. Sorry if that's too direct. Sorry, that was fleshly, sorry. There is some natural reaping and sowing where we can enter into sickness because we allow our thoughts to stay in fear. We allow our thoughts to stay in bitterness or unforgiveness. That's your free will. Your desire gets to choose that. So you have to get honest with yourself. Is it a direct issue for sin? But not everything is. We can't judge that someone's sickness is their direct result. That's why blind Bartimaeus came on and he said, no, it had nothing to do with him or his parents. That was an indirect because of the fall. We live in a fallen and broken world. But the moral of the story is, did God heal him even after that? Absolutely. Absolute forgiveness comes from absolve, which means forgive. God doesn't want any of us living in sickness anymore. That does not glorify him. We've got to begin to exercise our faith, live in self-control, be honest with ourselves, get truthful to ourselves. And if it's not us, then let's just eject out of the world, die to the flesh, walk as Jesus did, and let's all walk in victory. Amen? Amen. All right. So be blessed. Go walk in victory. Have a great day.